uh, in Colombia. You, you, well, Brother David, you, you've been to Colombia, you know, uh, we have gone through several difficult uh, stages in Colombia. At the moment, it's, it's becoming more difficult again. You know, it comes, in, co comes and goes, more or less, the situation there. But, but uh, when we were praying for the name of our, our church, when, when it became clear to us that God wanted us to start, start a church plant in Cali, Colombia, we're praying for the name. And actually, it was Teya who received, I, I would say, a word from the Lord about Psalm 91. And uh, the, the first uh, phrase, the phrases of the psalm is, is the name of our church. Our church is called El Abrigo del Altísimo, which translates to the shelter of the Most High in English. Uh, so we've had this psalm, always we've had it in mind, uh, and it has become relevant now. And it calls my attention that even reading the first few verses, how, how, how uh, powerful it is. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. It's really remarkable how, 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 how actually how relevant this psalm is for our situation in the present time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's certainly a good one, actually. There are a lot of people who are quoting that psalm over here, Hendrik, as well, at this time. So it's relevant to whatever country uh, we happen to be in. But when I was just thinking there today about what I would focus on this evening, I was really thinking uh, just on the theme of forgiveness. I think the Lord said that's what I should begin with because I taught a lot on forgiveness, how to practice forgiveness over here. But I noticed when I spoke on that theme in Colombia and also in uh, Bolivia, that an awful lot of people immediately became interested. <clears throat> no matter what stage of the sermon you brought it in, <clears throat> people were always very captivated uh, when you spoke about it. So I thought that I would just share with people again here this evening uh, just how I recommend that people forgive. And I have to practice this myself. I say that as soon as somebody upsets me, I start to bless them in the name of Jesus and I keep it up for as long as it takes. I'm going to say that again. <clears throat> as, soon as, <clears throat> as soon as somebody upsets me, I start to bless them in the name of Jesus and I keep it up for as long as it takes. Now, the biblical basis for that is actually very strong. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said we shouldn't just love our enemies, we should bless those who curse us. In Romans chapter 12, St. Paul, believe it or not, went even further. He said, bless those who persecute you. Now, that's a challenge. And then over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, uh, this is a time when the church was under severe persecution. Uh, and Peter said, uh, do not return evil with evil, or insult with insult, but with blessing. <coughs> For to this you were called, so that you yourselves may inherit a blessing. So isn't it interesting, actually, if we don't return evil with evil or insult with insult, uh, the first people who are actually blessed are we ourselves. And I can only say there is nothing restores my peace as quickly as whenever somebody upsets me. Um, if I hold on to a grudge, that is a barrier in our relationship with God if we refuse to do anything about it. I remember a preacher saying one night in St. Finian's at the Tuesday evening healing service, the heaviest burden anybody can bear is a grudge. But there's no need actually uh, to have to bear that burden because the Lord has shown us a way out. So I just say it again to anybody who is really hurt by somebody, start to bless that person in the name of Jesus and keep it up for as long as it takes. And any time you start to feel annoyed at them again, then bless them again and keep on blessing them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And again, we saw the fruit of that uh, in our trip to Bolivia. Uh, you mentioned that last week, just that time around the, the table uh, with, with Diane and, and her, her husband, Ankle. That was a very particular moment of that, wasn't it? It was. That's right. 
come in. Henrik, what, what do you find out? Just one of the things that I sense for people at the moment is where, where are they finding hope? And also how, how um, they would pray at the moment that some people are really um, flourishing in their prayer. Some people may be finding it difficult. Is there anything you might speak around that in terms of hope and prayer at the moment? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, in many occasions uh, you find that God's power becomes manifest through a difficult situation. And we go back to the Bible, we find in many occasions people come to Jesus with a, an impossible problem and he solves it and he does a miracle. So, so in order to really, you know, see God's power, sometimes we have to go through a crisis, go through difficulties, which we don't like, of course. It's not nice to go through difficulties. We'd rather be comfortable. But uh, I actually remember somebody saying, he said, the opposite of faith. Uh, we've always learned that fear is the opposite of faith, but actually I believe it's being comfortable mm -hmm. is, is the opposite of faith. And many times when we have traveled to South America with Brother David mm -hmm. and yourself, Fergus, we've mm -hmm. seen people in, physically in an uncomfortable position, spiritually, emotionally in many occasions, but even, even then we have seen the power of God even, even more obvious, obviously uh, uh, present in the situation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, something that struck me even here in Holland, is uh, in some churches I've heard them speak on on the blood of the lamb, uh, referring to uh, to the Exodus. Uh, you remember that in the Bible, when the people of God they were, they were about to leave Egypt, uh, there was the the death of the firstborn, and there was this angel of death that went through Egypt that particular night, and uh, and they uh, had to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts. And, you know, it's significant, of course, the blood of the lamb is the blood of Jesus uh, that protects us, forgives us, and washes our sins, washes our clean from, us clean from our sins, but also in the sense of protection. When, when we invoke the, na the name of Jesus and we, we, we think of the blood and we proclaim the blood of the lamb on our doorpost, I believe that, that there will be a protection. You know, and even if we go through difficulties, uh, God will be present right in the midst of them. So, so that's been really encouraging. And I'm just gleaning from what I gather from, from churches here in Holland and from people I talk to. Um, uh, and, and it's really wonderful how the Holy Spirit is emphasizing these principles in the church. So, so I believe that's a very hopeful message. You know, the blood of the Lamb that protects us. Uh, and washes us and, and cleanses us. Maybe just in response to that, um, Fergus, I could maybe just tell a story of something that has happened to me inside the past few weeks. Uh, there's a friend of mine and his sister was very ill, but she wanted to go home and they brought her home. Uh, but they asked me that if she rang me, would I speak to her on the telephone? But they, they thought it was unlikely that she would make contact because she really had lost contact uh, with church over many, many years. But the strange thing is that she did ring me and I talked to her about her relationship with God and she had very much let that go over a long period of time. But I said to her, would you like to put that relationship right? And she was hungry. There was no effing or boring. She wanted to put that relationship right. Well, I said, why don't you take about an hour just to think about that? And I'll ring you back in an hour's time. And if you feel the same way, then I will lead you in a prayer to help you to put that relationship with right, right. I rang her back in an hour's time and she still wanted to put this relationship right. I had a prayer of commitment in my hand. I read it out to her. She said she could say that okay. I led her through it really uh, phrase by phrase. And then whenever she made that act of commitment, I wrote on the back, this was a prayer said by this lady on David Jardine on a particular date. And I signed it at the bottom and I left a space for her to sign it above my signature. The family came because of lockdown. They collected the card, took it down to her. 
she was able to sign it and she passed away inside a few days. But the man who took the funeral at the graveside was able to say with absolute confidence that he knew where she was because she had made that act of commitment of her life to Jesus. It's, it, it's always a, a marvelous thing that when a minister gets a chance to do that. But in these circumstances, for me to help a lady whom I had never met at a time of lockdown and over the telephone and to make the most important decision that maybe she would ever make in her life. Hendrik, were you going to say something there? No, I just waved to the neighbor. Actually, I'm sitting in front of the window and he was looking in and I just waved to say hello. <laughs> no, but I, I, I remember Brother David in, in Potosi. Uh, you remember that, that group of pastors? Yes. They were, were so open, you know, and, and uh, Fergus, you were there as well. We were ministering to pastors and leaders there. Uh, and sometimes under very humble circumstances, you know, it's, it's a difficult place. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, <clears throat> forgiveness is so important even for people in the ministry, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like I always like the way the practical way you you teach you've taught us uh, about how to forgive. Uh, sometimes it it seems to be very difficult, but but you've taken us through some very practical mm -hmm. principles, it has made it so much easier to understand and to really practice it. And, and I believe it's an ongoing thing. Every day we have to kind of be aware of, of like make an inventory maybe uh, of the day. And uh, if anyone has offended us, bring it to the Lord immediately and not let it accumulate. I think that that would be important, but it's really been wonderful. And it's been a blessing to the people in South America, the way you have taught it uh, and, and you have made it so, uh, easy to understand and to practice it. That's really been wonderful. Well, the, the reason that I can teach it is because I have to practice it myself. But the one thing that I do know is that as a minister of the gospel, I cannot afford to hold grudges. And I don't hold grudges. If somebody upsets me, I put that right, especially within myself through prayer, as quickly as I possibly can. But if I was holding a grudge, when I go to lead worship or to preach or to pray with someone, it'll show the power of God will not be there uh, in all its fullness. I remember one time when I was um, in America doing a mission, uh, <clears throat> one or two of the organizers did something on me which upset me very deeply. And um, just about an hour and a half later, I had to take the final service of the whole mission uh, when I'm doing an event like that, I like to finish strongly. I wanted that service to finish very strongly. So I went back to my room and I walked up and down for an hour, blessing these two people in the name of Jesus over and over again. By the time I came to lead the service and to preach, my spirit was as free as a bird. And the strange thing is that both of them, who had no idea what I'd been doing, both of them came up afterwards and told me what a good service it was. So whenever I forgive people by blessing them in the name of Jesus, then the spirit comes alive within me. But if I refuse to do that and hold on to a grudge, then the spirit is dulled and that shows when you get up to speak or to lead worship. Yes. Amen. Sorry, Amen. Andrew. No, I, I just came to my mind, Brother David. Um, maybe not... Well, it's related to the to the topic of forgiveness, I believe. You remember we were over in that church when the pastor came telling us, he said, I've been praying for people to come and preach here from other countries. Yes, I, I don't do. have don't do the finances to invite people, but the Lord had given him a word that he would have international speakers come to his church to minister to them. And, and well, the team was there. You were there with the team from Northern Ireland. And it was kind of an answer to his prayers. It was. But then there was this very powerful word you got about bereavement. Do you remember that? I do remember that, actually. Wasn't that in a, in a, in a former movie theater? Well, that service yeah. was terrible. And, and it was all tiered, so it was. Yes. But, um, it was a rather large congregation. I remember that. 
That's right. Uh, Absolutely. And you have made a, a call for prayer uh, about bereavement, but also forgiveness. You know, there were so many people that came forward for a prayer. It was amazing. Well, they just flooded. They flooded forward that day. They did. That's right. But um, if, if I could just maybe just say something just on a slightly uh, different subject, I have gone back uh, over the past week or two to listening to God. I always said that prayer is not just talking to God, but it's also listening. Last weekend, I set aside time on both Saturday and Sunday to listen to God on, on one or two specific subjects. I said, Lord, how would you advise us to move ahead in equipping for life? I didn't talk much during these times of prayer. Just asked one or two questions, and then I listened. And I felt the Lord say to me immediately, he said, I don't want you to focus only on the areas that you're still working in and equipping for life, like the Shankle Road and Rathcool and Monkstown and Lisbourne and Top Mona and, and Wheatfield. I want you to take the ministry out now into the whole of Northern Ireland. And then I said to him, Lord, we're not doing very much work actually with teenagers. What would you advise that we do? And almost immediately the answer came, go into secondary schools. You'll have the atmosphere and the structure there uh, to be able to make a significant contribution to the lives and the well-being of those young people. And then without inviting them, he gave me a third suggestion. I want you to establish a group of people within the ministry who will be called Friends of Equipping for Life. They could be individuals. They could be clergy, they could be lay people, could be churches, could be organizations, whoever. But they will support, they'll be a bunch of supporters of equipping for life. And they'll receive your literature, they'll promote it, they'll tell other people about the ministry, they'll pray for the ministry, they'll make financial contributions occasionally. And I said, wasn't, wasn't that absolutely amazing? I listened, and in about 15 or 20 minutes, the Lord gave me things that would keep me working, you know, for weeks and months to come. And I felt whenever we had finished that he said, that's all I'm giving you today. If you start to put those into practice, that'll keep you working for a very long time. But, you know, I couldn't have worked that out with my best thinking. I couldn't have worked that out, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in a month of some days. And yet the Lord gave me those three things in 15 to 20 minutes. So I just say to people, if you've got a difficulty in your life or there's a decision that you need to make and you're not too sure which decision to make, uh, or if you realize that after lockdown is lifted, life is going to be different and you're not too sure uh, what it's going to be like, why not take time actually just to sit quietly with the Lord and bring those requests to him and ask him if he can give guidance at this particular time. You know, Andrew Murray, the South African minister, probably, I think, originally of Dutch extraction, I think, um, Andrew, he said that what God says to us in prayer far more important than what we say to God. Mm. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. And th this has been uh, amazing tonight. Just thank you so much. I'm so glad I hit the record button <laughs> there just to capture this. <laughs> So a powerful teaching from the, the both of you and just thank you for, for that. I think from, if we're to do this again, I'm going to try and get you both on a bit earlier, just to allow the, enough time actually, because these are real gems. And for you watching, if you're watching live, I'm sure you've been blessed. And um, the sense is that this, this is a very precious time the Lord has given us, even in the, I'm not just talking about this, this recording, but in this season that we're in and the illustration of that lady who gave her life to the Lord just before she passed into the kingdom of, of God. Uh, I think the Lord is, is touching hearts as never before, allowing this time to make a right relationship with him and with each other. And uh, both Henrik and Brother David, you've given us uh, really from the word of God how we might do that. And it really it provides a beautiful springboard just in these last moments to, to lead us into prayer. And I would love, uh, we would love if both of you would just lead us in prayer and just beginning with, with Henrik and then straight on to you, Brother David. Um, right. Again, and David, you might lead us for a prayer for healing particularly, but to Henrik, if you would begin just the, the prayer that's in your heart at the moment and then Brother David would follow, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Henrik. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you tonight for your presence, even over the internet, Lord. Uh, we, can, we can sense that there's, your spirit is uh, operating and is bringing us together, Lord. We thank you for each and every one who's listening tonight. Lord, thank you that you, you always speak uh, encouragement to your people. Even in the midst of uh, difficulties, Lord, you, you speak encouragement because we, uh, it's important that we, are, uh, that we have hope and, and, and strength, Lord, by your spirit. So we thank you tonight even for this time of remembering things we have seen happen in South America. Even when Brother David has been over there and, and people from Northern Ireland and Fergus uh, and, and people from Divine Healing Ministries, Lord, we thank you for everything you've done that's still there lingering lord in the atmosphere teaching about forgiveness even in the midst of bereavement and trouble and and difficulties the impact has been made on the lives and even tonight lord each and every one of us if we find that we need to forgive if we find that we're holding a grudge against anyone we just want to surrender it to you and we pray for your perfect peace even now during these times of quarantine and and gradually going into a uh, lifting the quarantine when people are fearful. I found that particularly today when I was out in a shop, people were so scared, so afraid. Even, even some of them were angry and frustrated. Lord, uh, we just want to bless each and every one. We want to bless the people of Northern Ireland, people of Holland, of South America. And we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Lord, I think we should pray for Hendrik and for his wife, Tia. I want to thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices that they have made for over 30 years to bring the gospel to Colombia and Bolivia and other countries in South America. And just pray, Lord, that as they're separated by current circumstances, that that won't go on for too long. But that even if it does, Lord, that the assurance of your presence with them uh, will really be the greatest comfort that any person could ever have. Lord, I want to pray for Fergus in his position of leadership in Divine Healing Ministries and for that ministry and for the whole team, Lord. And just give thanks for the opportunity that they have given to myself and Hendrik and many other people to use this means of communication, Lord, to bring the gospel message. And I'd like to just be in a moment of quiet now, just to give each person watching and listening this evening, just give you a chance to bring one person before the Lord in the silence, one person whom you know who needs God's healing touch at this time. Just pray quietly for that person now. Where would you like the Lord to touch you personally this evening? I'll give you another moment of silence just to tell the Lord where you would like him to touch you. Now we're going to pray God's blessing on one another. I thought that the way to forgive was to bless people in the name of Jesus and to keep it up for as long as it takes. We have an opportunity now just to bless one another and all the people whom we have brought before the Lord just in the silence. So everybody who's joining us, could we just pray a very simple prayer? Everyone joining us this evening, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. Everyone joining us this evening, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. Just pray that a few times now within yourself.
Just a few more moments, please. Everybody joining us this evening. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. Hi, everybody joining us this evening. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. I bless you with the power of God's Spirit being released into your lives and into the lives of the people whom we have brought before you. And in the name of Jesus, I bless those who are in the front line at this time. I can hear people out at their doors applauding and making noise on behalf of the National Health Service. In the name of Jesus, we bless those people. And we bless those whom they are looking after who are sick with this coronavirus. In the name of Jesus, I bless those who have realized through our session this evening the need that they have to forgive. And I bless them that they may be able to practice blessing the people who have hurt them. And as they bless them, to find anger and anxiety just being reduced and peace being received and restored. And I just felt in my spirit that there are people who are carrying anxieties and that we need to let go of those, just to release those and to leave them in the hands of the Lord. And so if there is anybody who's carrying an anxiety, who's watching in this evening, I bless you with that verse from Psalm 55. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous perish. And just on behalf of all who are joining us personally this evening, and all those for whom they have prayed, may the healing and the strengthening mercies of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is present with us here, now at this very moment and in the days to come, enter powerfully into each one of you, into your souls, into your minds, into your bodies. Heal you of anything that may harm you and give you God's peace. Amen.